We're getting ready to start the um, the afternoon, the first session of this afternoon. Um, so, really appreciate. I know there's a tremendous vibe at lunch. Everyone likes to catch up, but um, now we're back to um, the program, and we're still continue to be on pretty tight timelines. So, getting everyone sat down and taking there's a some really important um, sessions that we're going to go through this afternoon. And the first one is our Industry's good friend, Dr. John Morton from Jamora, Proprietary Limit. John is a veterinary epidemiologist. He says he, to be sure, to say he's not a geneticist. No, both struggle, I struggle with. But he was applied his epi epidemiology skills to genetics questions in feeding the genes project and when assessing the economics of genomic testing of heifers and looking at trends in daughter fertility ABVs. He'll, John will give us an update on these trends today, as well as presenting some recent work on survival ABVs. Welcome, John, and um, survival and daughter fertility breeding values. So when I, um, I said yes to present, um, this was some months ago, and. Um, uh, at, th at that stage, I said, look, I will have some stuff on the survival ABV, but I haven't started yet. So when I clicked send on the email, I thought, gee, this is a little bit like diving off the high diving board and hoping there's a bit of water down there. But it turns out there was water down there. The story's not quite finished, but, geez, it's, it's been pretty interesting so far. So I want to tell you that. Also, at Herd 21, I presented on the daughter fertility breeding value trends. I want to give you an update on that. But in one, in one word... That breeding value is going like a steam drain. It is absolutely excellent. But I'll show you a slide at the end on that. So, um, I did notice the, the genetic pro I was thinking about this word survival, and I noticed the genetic progress report uses the word longevity. And then I, I submitted a paper for publication on the daughter fertility breeding value, and the editor wrote that because I was writing in that paper, survival, survival, and, and, and there's the same question, you know, so. Now, I sort of thought, this is not a, big, not a big point in this, but I just thought, so survival has got a bit of a context of some adverse period and we survived it, you know, and I, and I wouldn't want Australian consumers to think our cows are in an adverse environment, because I don't think they are. So it's just a question about, is that the right word? That, that's all I'm raising, really. I don't, I don't want people to misinterpret um, what this thing is telling us. It's about long life of cows. Or, or that's what it's aiming to do. So, first thing was to look at the trends for survival ABVs. These are um, trends for cows by year of birth of the cow. And I published, uh, I showed you those plots in, non, in, in Herd 21 for those that were there. That's um, Holstein's. That's Jersey's. The big story is in Holstein's. There's a small story in Jersey's, and that little, there's just a little trickle down, and that, that trend has continued. I've added two years of data since Herd 21. This is why I'm saying this thing is going like a steam train. We'll explore that more at the very end. It's quite extraordinary what's happening with daughter fertility breeding value. Now, in contrast, there's the survival ABVs, and they're quite different. So, so the first point is survival ABV is measuring partly fertility, but other things as well. And it's a totally different pattern, totally different pattern for Holsteins. When the Holsteins were cruising downwards, 1980, 90, 2000, it was still going up, almost a straight line. I'm not sure if that, about that little squish there. And, and similarly for jerseys, still going up, even though the daughter fertility breeding value is going down. So at this stage, I'm pretty pleased, because the only reason I got into survival ABV is pure curiosity and the fact I had the data, the data I'd used for the daughter fertility breeding value, I thought, geez, I can use that exact same data set to answer some questions on survival. And so the first thing was, they're not the same thing. They're not the same thing. Now, here's your first job. This is a survival curve. This is using, I've actually got um, every, every lactation for, by every cow since, born since 1980 sitting on my, my computer. So it's a massive, massive data set. Um, I've only used from 1990 on because for some reason there's a whole bunch of those cows. Where, where's Erica? There's a lot of those cows who were born in 80 and 90. I, I haven't got a date of birth for them. So, um, oh, sorry, um, 
Yes, a car from 1980 to 1990, and I can't find a date of birth, so I thought, just in case there's a bit of bias there, I'll just go from 1990 on. Okay, now, you've got to learn to interpret these things. This is a survival curve for cows that have calved at least once. So we're not starting from date of birth of the calf, only because I know there's a lot of calves that don't get into the system until they calve. So I thought I'd better start from calving on. Now, here's your first job. Complete this sentence. 50% of cows last more than... Yep, six years. Let's go through the process. 50%, go across here, down here, just over six. Okay, complete this question. 25% of the cows last more than... Yeah, about nine. Yeah, nine. Okay, how about this question? Um, what percent of cows last more than eight years? Yeah, about 30, yep. So my point simply is, you can interpret this graph, you can, you can pick a, a line, a point over here on the y-axis. Oh, what's happening here? Or, and this is my preference, you can pick a point on the x-axis. Totally valid either way. It turns out, um, and my brain really likes going upwards, not across, um, and it turns out eight years is a pretty good place to look at. So let's keep watching that one. Um, about 30%, that's for all cows, all breeds, born from 1990. Um, okay, that's the survival curve. So let's, then we start doing some survival curves. Oh, one more thing, sorry. This is, um, this is time from birth to when I reckon the cow left her last herd. Now, there are some cows that leave a milk recording herd and go into a non-milk recording herd, and I don't have them in the data. Yeah, so this curve is slightly, is slightly biased backwards a bit because if a cow was in a herd, then went to a non-milk recording herd, I say, well, she left that herd, that's all I know about her, so I guess she, was, she might have, well, that's, that's, the, that's where I'll, st I'll stop her data. Um, if, a, if longevity was improving, well, if longevity was improving, what would the new, what would the new curve look like? Where would it be? Yeah, where, well, really, would it be this side or would it be that side? Yeah, this side, right? So if longevity is improving, the new line will be sitting over to the right. If long gear is going backwards, the new line will be sitting on the left. So let's watch out for trends. Now, you can't see much trend here, which did surprise me. Um, Holsteins and jerseys, the, the two different colours, well, they're, they're just about bang on top of each other. Now, this is slightly different from, for those that are at the G-Info forum yesterday, where Majid's results are the jerseys are a little bit less lived, less long lived than the Holsteins. And that probably is a difference in methods. And, and my other point, quickly, I'll mention is um, it's so lucky that McConnell and Majid are working on survival right this very period. And so I'm real, I've got them lined up to look at this stuff and, and we're going to meet up next week and, and work out if there's anything useful in all this stuff. So that's quite fortuitous. So Holstein's jerseys, to my great surprise, um, very similar across all those um, years of birth. Now, survival ABV. A little bit more complicated, let's do Holsteins. And furthermore, let's do my magic eight year point. So can you see the colours there? What, what colour is that one there? Green, <laughs> which, which category of survival ABV is it? Yep, and what about the top end? Can, what, what, what category is that one? Yeah, right here, so we're going from low survival ABV to high, yeah? And is survival getting longer or shorter? Longer, yep, yeah, remember? If the curve goes to the right, it's longer. Uh, very, very similar pattern for jerseys. So just lock that point, that fact in. There's, there's fact number one. Well, no, sorry, that's fact number two. Fact number one is survival ABV has gone up steadily over time, unlike the Holstein daughter fertility breeding value. Fact number two, the cows with high survival ABVs um, are lasting longer than cows with shorter survival ABVs. Radio. And you can probably tell from my tone of voice that there's something coming, and, and sure as hell there is. Let's look at year of birth. So this is like, let's move from the cow level to the whole population. And you, you might have heard me carry on about, we've got to evaluate all these things at the herd level, not at the cow level. Cow level is a means to an end, but it's the herd that matters for a commercial producer. So let's translate to the herd level. Okay, so let's have a look. Um, now, let's use my eight-year point again. 
Now, I'm not sure if you can see the colours there, but I can tell you those, the cows bought in 1990 are the top line, right? And down, down, down. And finally, the cows bought in 2010, they're the bottom line. So what does that mean? Is, long, is, is longevity getting longer or shorter? Shorter. Notice the, um, these cows, of course, the curve stops here because time hasn't happened yet for them. They gotta, that's where I chopped, I chopped off the data for them, but that line will go out here somewhere. Um, oh, sorry, one more quick point. Can I go backwards on this thing? Yeah. One more very quick point. Um, if, if we can breed for, for longer-lived cows, Where's the big impact? I used to think the big impact was we're going to have these herds of really old cows. And I thought, holy shit, what about mastitis, poor fertility, so on, so on, so on. But in fact, that's not going to happen. The big impact is the middle-aged cows. We'll have more middle-aged cows. We'll have a few more older-aged cows, say 12 or more, and 14, hardly any more. But, but when we say we're, we're heading for longevity, we're not heading for herds of old cows. We're heading for herds of more middle-aged cows and less two-year-olds. Um, oh, one more thing too. I did find some human survival curves, and gee, they're different from this. And my point, I'm not going to pursue this now, but my point simply is, if we're going to tell the public we're going to have long-lived cows, we just got to keep this realistic. We're not going to have cows that have a survival curve that looks like humans, yeah? I'll, we can explore that later if you like. If we expect cows to calve every 18 months, two years max, the survival curve is not going to look like the human survival curve. Um, the reason I mention this is because if you look on some of the animal rights groups' websites, I'll say things like, the average dairy cow only lasts five years, but they can last 15 years. And the inference is, they should all be lasting 15 years. That, that is not going to happen in commercial farms. So we, we'd really have to say that to the public. It's just not possible. So that's a slight diversion. Okay. So, so far we've got three facts. The survival ABV has been going up over time. The cows that, I'll, I'll, I'll phrase this carefully, the cows that have higher survival ABV live longer than cows that have shorter, uh, lower survival ABV. That's fact two. Fact three, survival is getting worse. Radio. So that's, I think I might have listed those facts here. Oh, yeah, okay. Now this, at this point, I thought, my goodness, how do you reconcile all that? This just can't hang together, all these three facts. Because if that's true, and that's true, how come that's happening? Yeah? So this is where I realised this was fairly serious because even when I was running, I was thinking about this. That's how serious this problem was in my head. And certainly at nights, so I was thinking about this a lot. And, and so from here on, here's a, um, a proposal to explain this. Now, the proposal could be wrong, but um, there are some insights into reproductive management that come out of this. Let's have a look. Um, replacement rates have not gone down, yeah? There might be a hint they've gone up over time, just generally flat. Each of these is um, all the cows that, um, well, all the herds in a, in a given year most herds are inside the box. There's a few in the, out on the whiskers, and there's some really outliers out here. So my simple, my key point here is, um, oh, and very few, very few Jersey herds have met my criteria for a herd. I'm pretty fussy about what I call a herd, so um, we, there's not much, there's no information out at this end. But there's no evidence that over the entire country replacement rates are going down. So that's a, that's a key fact. So then I did this. I said, now let's just hypothesise. Um, um, a 500 cow seasonal calving herd, and the owner says, I want to calve 500 each year. That's, yeah. So I said, oh, well, okay, that's fine. Let's make up some numbers here. This is purely hypothetical, but I said, let's say they've got 10 deaths in compulsory culls. Maybe a little bit light on, but that's fine. That leaves 490, okay? Let's say a 20% empty rate, seasonal calving. Let's say he's only got about a 12 week mating period, so 20%, yeah, about, probably about average. So that's 20%, that leaves these guys here. What happens to them? Well, let's say we cull five of them and we keep the rest, and of those, three of them are bought, that leaves 384 to carve, right here. And in the meantime, of course, we've got the heifers down here, let's say 120, still 120, um, only 3% not pregnant, that's about normal, maybe a little bit high, 117, one of those are bought, 116, there's our 500, right here. So that's a replacement rate of 23% in that hypothetical herd. Now, I'd say 
My interpretation is that herd is just, is just holding it all together only because they've only got five of the pregnant ones culled. Now, I would have thought a herd that size, like we call them voluntary culls, but there's some cows that really should go even though they're pregnant, yeah? So the term voluntary is a little bit disingenuous. There could even be animal welfare reasons why some of those pregnant cows should be sold. So I reckon that herd is barely holding it together. So let's say they improve their fertility, so I'll, I'll move this down to 15%, then I'll read you the numbers, right here. And, and so now I've got not five cull, but 29, so this is looking a little bit more comfortable to, to get rid of these cows that are pregnant, but really they shouldn't do any more seasons. So that's looking better. Okay, and, and one key point in this is, what I, well, when I thought this through, if you improve your repro performance, you can take the, the benefits a few different ways. Yeah? You, might, you might choose to take, you might change your calving system. So you might go from year round to split or split to seasonal. Um, or you might change your start of calving date. And I, I'm, what I mean here is go earlier. So you might be seasonal and you're, and you're starting on the 15th of June, you go to the 15th of May. Now, that would be really, really hard if you've got poor repro performance. But if you've got good repro performance, you'll do it in two years. No trouble at all. So that's one way you might take the benefit. You might say, look, I'm just sick of this, you know, 12 weeks of breeding, how about 10, yeah? Especially if I'm all AI, that's two less weeks AI, that's pretty cool. So you might take it like that. Or you might do what this herd has done, which is just put an increase in culling pressure. So rather than five, we'll have 29 culled. So more pressure on, on the herd for culling. The, th the fourth alternative is I can cut my replacement rate with the consequential benefits of that. And the the key point here is only one of those options changes longevity. Yeah, that's the only one that changes longevity. All the others, the longevity would not change. Radio. So now I'm starting to pull these, these facts together as to how come those th these three apparently discordant facts are all happening. Um, oh, so I'll just go back a step. Oh, okay, so then I said, well, well, let's do the replacement rate thing. So I read you the numbers. And I was, I've cut, I remember this was 120, it's now 100. Yeah? So this is a herd that they went down from 20% not pregnant to 15%, and they decided to take that benefit as reduce, reduced replacement rate. So I, I, I wind this back from 120 to 100. So there's 20, let's say it's 2,000 to, uh, to rear a heifer from, from birth to first calving. Um, that's uh, 40 grand. There's 40 grand saving right there. Um, but, but now I'm worried about this again. So now we're back down to nine cold, yeah? It was five, then it went up to 20 something, 23, now five. So, so I would have thought that's, not, that's pretty tight still. So we've got ourselves back in a tight situation. So at this point I thought, gee, I'm starting to realize why, why some farmers may not want to cut the replacement rate as much as I would think they could just because this is all okay, we just scrape in if we get 15%, but what if we have a bad year and we're 18% or 19 or 20 or 23? 23 would be a disaster in this herd. So there's a key point there. If we want to, we want to cut replacement rate and increase longevity, well, we've got to help farmers do it safely because this farmer may be very anxious about that 15%. It's all very well now, but what if it's not 15? What if it's worse? So. So therefore, my conclusion so far is the survival ABV is not increasing longevity, partly because of the way we manage seasonal. And I could do the same for split calving herds and I'll get the same conclusion. It could be different in year round calving. I don't know enough about year round calving. So the question becomes, well, if we're not getting longevity, what are we getting with survival ABV? And, and I'll put question marks in, some of these, in front of some of these things. I was gonna take those question marks out and, and there was a presentation yesterday by Michelle about um, um, calf survival, and I'm even more confident about taking them out. So the first thing I think the survival ABV is doing is it's putting pressure on all these traits. So these are genetic correlations, so not surprising. Um, the, the correlation between survival ABV and fertility is 0.52, so quite a high correlation. So, so by putting pressure on survival ABV, we're, we're actually pushing daughter fertility up a little bit more than would, what it would otherwise be. And so on down. So here we are, um, somatic cell count. Mastitis, um, memory, um, oh, oh, depth, oh, depth, yeah. 
um, for attachment, yeah? So we're putting pressure on all those things just because we're, we're putting pressure on survival ABV, even though we're not getting longevity. We are getting cows that we don't like to cull, yeah? And that's, and I guess that's a good thing. The one thing I'm not that happy about is, um, uh, where are we? Um, we're quite a high correlation for milk, but far less for fat and protein. Now, if we're getting paid on solids and um, getting a penalty for milk volume, that's not great. But all the other things I would have thought were good. So therefore, I conclude the survival ABV is doing some good things, but I do, I do wonder, I do wonder whether um, the survival ABV weighting is too high because that weighting is based on the premise these cows are living longer and that's not what's going on, not, not at the moment. So finally, um, here's my summary. Uh, longevity is important for social licence. I don't want to be implying that the only way you can make money is by having long-lived long cows. I don't think that's the case at all. But, um, but certainly that's happening. There's that is unquestionably happening. So is that, and, and certainly for that re reduced replacement rate, you can improve profitability. But it only will happen if, you if the herd manager chooses to reduce the replacement rate. And that's not happening, it's hardly happening. And that's driven by better reprep performance. That's the only way you can reduce your replacement rate. Yeah? Only if you choose that option. And that's the province of good management plus the door to fertility ABV, not the, survival, oh, not the survival ABV. Although the survival ABV is helping. It's pushing door to fertility breeding value up through that correlation. So I reckon I'm still, this is an hypothesis as to what's going on. But I do reckon it's worth pursuing, and it's so lucky that McConnell and the Majid are working on this right now, so we're, we're going to chase some of these questions next week. Um, and I do think that's an important one. If we want herds to have long, lower replacement rates, we've got to help them get there safely. So there's quite a lot of um, thinking to go on. Um, now, finally, I'm actually into my question time, Graham. <laughs> um, these are the, the curves for daughter fertility breeding value. And these curves went to about two years less than this two years ago. Now, I've added the dexter two years on, and the trends, the trends are unequivocal, unequivocal. So what's been going on here is, here's the sires coming crashing down through the 80s, 90s, 2000. Plateauing here, the daughter fertility breeding value was introduced in 2004 and revamped, I think, in 2013. Um, and then, so there's the sires. Here's the cows following. Now, look what's going on here. The sires are worse than the dams. The yellow is the dam. The sires are worse than the dams, so the progeny were worse than their mum. So this was upside down genetic progress, yeah? Whereas over here, now it's happening what should be happening. The sire, the red, um, blue, sorry, the sires are better than the dams, and so the daughters are better than their mums. That's what should have been happening all the time, but it, did what, but it wasn't. The key one is the herd, the green dash line. Um, that's what farmers want. That's what drives fertility for the herd. It's not about cows, it's about what the herd average is. Um, and my final point is, we've got a fair way to go to get that back up to say 1980 levels, but geez, we're, we're really on track for doing it. Um, just across the jerseys very quickly, the trends are down, they're not massively steep, but gee, I don't, I don't like seeing that downward trend, but that's, that's just my preference. Thanks, Graham. Thanks very much. I'm not sure. Is there any questions for John? As we're out there. It's Christian, could you, that mic that's just behind you? But sorry, Christian, there's a mic directly behind. Sorry. Is that correct? No, could you just do it again? Yeah. I've just turned it on, sorry. Okay. I think you said earlier that even though survival ABVs are increasing, the longevity is not? Um, yes, exactly. That's, that's two of the facts. Survival ABV is increasing, longevity is not. Absolutely two facts that are true. Have you taken uh, or thought possibly that could be due to a couple of factors? One is an increasing exit rate of dairy farmers and therefore more cows getting sold for one reason or another and potentially a decrease in herd recording numbers. So because when a cow in your figures goes from a herd recording herd to a non-recording herd, that's, that's deemed to be terminated. 
Uh, yeah, that second point, that's a very good point. I've got to think that through because there's no question that my curves are a little bit biased for that reason. Whether that explains this, I'm not sure. Uh, the first question was, um, and I'm sorry, what was the first question? Um, Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, but, but that, that, yes, I totally agree with that. that. But that comes back to my point. My, my point is, this is a very unusual ABV because this is, I think, the only ABV where the herd manager pretty much decides what value the cow will have, yeah? Take um, pin set. Once you've, once you've picked the sire and got the pregnancy, you've got no control over pin set. You've got a lot of control over when this cow leaves the herd. Sure, there'll be some voluntary, some, some compulsory culls and, and some deaths, but for all the rest, the herd manager's deciding. And, and so things like that are coming into it. So that's my exact point, that you won't get longevity until you start cutting replacement rate. It's, and that's, that's, but still my other point is survival ABV is still doing some good stuff on top of, even though it's not giving us longevity, it's still giving us cows that we don't like the cull. And that's a good thing. Okay, thanks. I'm going to call it here for John, but thank, and he'll be here. So I'm going to say there's a question from her 23, and I'm not sure where that origin represents, but um, there's a question is, about is milk. From in here, then? Yeah, yeah, so if you could I'll catch up with John, that'd be great. Thank you again, John.